over 100 new Pokemon in Pokemon Diamond and Pokemon Pearl. They're gonna be everywhere. When a generation of Pokemon arrives, we excitingly examine the new Pokemon. For in those mysterious early days, almost everything seems viable. Sure, there are no doubters like Garchomp and Aegislash that are more or less guaranteed to be good, but there are several Pokemon that leave little to no impact on a metagame that seemed like they'd be good at first. And those expectations can leave us feeling more than a bit deflated when we discover that they are, in fact, not as amazing as we thought they'd be. And to help me with this topic, our friend Joey aka Pokeaim is here. Yo, what's up guys? You got Pokeaim here. And thank you, False Swipe, for having me. So without further ado, here are our top picks for the Pokemon that seemed good, but ended up being the biggest letdowns ever. When Generation 3 or Advance was the current gen, Dusclops was the spin blocker of choice for dedicated stall teams, and it seemed perfect. Huge bulk, access to the amazing Will-O-Wisp, and easily capable of beating any rapid spinner one-on-one. -on -one. However, Dusclops' flaws were highly significant and held it back from serious use. Eventually, even on those stall teams, its laughably low HP stat meant that, while bulky, it wasn't as incredible a hit taker as its defense and special defense would suggest. It was further hampered as a hit taker by its lack of a reliable recovery. Paint Split and Rest were both incredibly exploitable, and this was exacerbated by the fact that it couldn't even heal with leftovers, as it was affected by the ever-present Sandstorm. Finally, it was completely inept offensively, the definition of a passive wall. However, in Generation 4, Dusclops gained the buff that so desperately needed, beyond just having a cooler name, design, and becoming a fantastic villain in Pokemon Mystery Dungeon 2. Dust Noir seemed like the perfect competitive upgrade. It was even bulkier than Dust Clops, with buffs to HP and both defenses. It wasn't just a better wall either. Its attack stat was much, much higher than Dusclops's, which allowed it to actually strike back at the opponent. This new attack stat even allowed it to effectively utilize a priority move, a rare trait for a wall, in the form of its brand new stab, Shadow Sneak. Yep, Dust Noir seemed like the whole package and was an incredibly popular sight in early Diamond and Pearl. In addition to blocking Rapid Spin, its immunity to all the close combats flying around was valuable as well. Sadly, this didn't last, and Dust Noir quickly became the subject of mockery. What happened? Well, remember those flaws that held Dusclops back? Yeah, Dust Noir had all of those too. It couldn't be the hit taker it wanted to be thanks to its pitiful HP, lack of a reliable recovery, and an inability to heal even passively in the ever-present Sandstorm. This was a death sentence in and of itself, even before considering all the new additions Generation 4 brought that were utterly ruinous. Stealth Rock hampered it even more, new huge base power moves moves like Draco Meteor boosted by powerful new items like Life Orb and Choice Specs cut right through its awful HP, and the new physical special split meant Pursuit was everywhere. Plus, Noir wasn't anywhere near good enough to justify its use in spite of these flaws. Its supposed higher attack stat turned out to not really mean anything in practice, as uninvested base 100 attack isn't necessarily bad, but it is when the moves you're using have such pitifully low base power. There was stringent competition too, in the form of Spiritomb, whose lack of a dark weakness was invaluable in not fearing pursuit as much, as well as taking attacks like Lucario's Crunch and Machamp's Payback. And the official coup de grace came with the release of Platinum, which bestowed the Rotom appliances upon the metagame, which hilariously outclassed Spiritomb, let alone Dust Noir. Perhaps the most disappointing thing about Noir is that, despite how terrible it was, to inexperienced players, it seemed rife with potential. So they kept trying it in OU, and thus it never got a chance to drop to UU, where it likely would have been quite good. And so Dust Noir's death discouraging debut disappointed denizens of generation 4 OU. The hype around Mimikyu's disguise ability was massive, and for good reason. New generations of Pokemon tend to bring enormous levels of power creep, and finding ways to slow those Pokemon down can be a real challenge. With Mimikyu, you had the ultimate get out of jail free card. Even if you were facing down a plus 6 special attack Magearna using Twinkle Tackle, it wouldn't matter, the disguise could take it. This ability paired perfectly with Red Card, but most of the time, you wouldn't even need to, because Mimikyu seemed like quite the threatening Pokemon in its own right. An interesting stab combination, a decent attack stab boosted further by 
Swords Dance, Solid Speed, and even Priority. In fact, this was another potentially amazing application of Mimikyu's Disguise, using it offensively. Revenge killing it was much more difficult than other sweepers, because it could take any one hit, which could be absolutely devastating late game. The possibilities of this exciting new ability were vast, and potentially revolutionary. As such, Mimikyu saw quite a bit of usage early in Sun and Moon, but it eventually petered out. So what happened? It wasn't a bad Pokemon per se, but it was certainly disappointing relative to the expectations placed upon it early. It didn't do as much as one would hope. It had two really notable problems. One, it couldn't be used for much of the game. As any attack it wasn't immune to would bust the disguise. As such, its team was often stuck playing with five Pokemon. Mimikyu's unique typing meant it did have some nice immunities to play with, but nothing it could pull off reliably given its constant fear of coverage moves. Two, even if the disguise was preserved, Mimikyu was quite weak by OU standards. Thus, it struggled both as a revenge killer and a sweeper. The latter even with the extra turn afforded it by disguise. It's a shame, because OU was often at immense risk of being overrun by monstrous sweepers, and disguise would have been great if attached to a better Pokemon. Sadly, Mimikyu was just too mediocre, and players eventually shifted to Ditto for this role instead. To diverge from disappointment for a brief second, the prospect of Mimikyu and OU was not so tantalizing that its usage would never drop. As such, it fell to Yu Yu, and there, it became quite excellent. In Generation 6, Mega Evolution sometimes took lower tier Pokemon like Kangaskhan and made them comically overpowered. At other times, it was even more ridiculous because these monstrous buffs were given to Pokemon that were already great, like the threatening Gengar being given one of the most absurd Mega Forms in the game. Other Megas on excellent Pokemon such as Tyranitar weren't necessarily overpowered, but they were incredibly dangerous. So when it was discovered that one of the best Pokemon in the game, the formerly Uber Garchomp, had a Mega Form, people briefly lost their minds. It was already borderline ridiculous to deal with given its natural power, phenomenal stab combination, and perfect speed stat. Its strength boosted further by Swords Dance. Plus, it was incredibly naturally bulky. Megas generally made Pokemon faster, stronger, bulkier. However, some, like the Charizards, didn't get a speed boost. Even if Mega Chomp didn't get a speed boost, that'd be fine. It didn't really need any help in the speed department. In fact, if it did get a speed boost, that would probably point it in the direction of being overpowered. The only real question at first was whether Mega Chomp would simply be excellent or if it would be broken. A Mega Chomp with no changes to his speed, instead only having increased power and bulk, would already be an incredible force to be reckoned with. A stronger, bulkier Mega Chomp that was also faster could very well be too much. Wait, Mega Garchomp is slower than base Garchomp? Okay, forget it, never mind. All things considered, Mega Garchomp wasn't a bad Pokemon. Its speed was still quite decent, its power and bulk were stunning, and it became even more powerful in Sandstorm thanks to Sand Force, the ability it gained upon Mega Evolving. However, more often than not, it was worse than base Garchomp by virtue of that lower speed. It dipped below absolutely huge threats like Landorus Incarnate, base 100s like Volcarona, Manaphy, Mega Medicham, Mega Gardevoir, and the Mega Charizards. The base 98 Hydreigon, even below base 95s like Kurum and Kurum Black. Given that much of what made Garchomp so threatening was the speed that allowed it to fire off its devastating stabs, this was game changing in the worst way for it. This wasn't something you wanted to waste your team's mega slot on, given all the other threatening ones you could have been using. A mega Garchomp with unchanged speed would have been one of the very best Pokemon in OU, and would have probably gotten some buzz about potential brokenness. Instead, mega Garchomp was regarded as one of the worst, most wasteful megas. Talk about disappointment. Okay, it wasn't all doom and gloom though. Incredibly specific, especially compared to its base form, Mega Garchomp actually had a decent niche. Once the metagame had developed and the initial disappointment had worn off, several sand teams that became popular in the wake of the Landorus Incarnate ban enjoyed utilizing Mega Garchomp's incredible power. Not only did Sand Force boosted Earthquakes ensure Clefable stood no chance at checking Mega Chomp, Sand Force and Swords Dance boosted Stone Edges off of Mega Chomp's huge attack, tore through would-be checks like Landorus Steering and Tangro. While Sand Force Earthquake blasted through Slowbro and Quagsire, which helped pave the way for its fellow sand abusing teammate, Sand Rush Excadrill, to clean up. Rush Excadrill's huge speed also helped compensate for the loss of speed on Mega Garchomp. Plus, if facing a team with several fast attackers that regular Garchomp outsped, the Garchomp user could simply elect to not Mega Evolve and maintain that speed stat. It could even for one turn, act like Hannah Montana and have the best of both worlds. Thanks to Gen 6's Mega Mechanics, the speed stat from the base form was maintained on the turn that the Pokemon Mega Evolved 
evolve. This was usually a hindrance for initially slow mega Pokemon like Metagross, who wouldn't get to their huge speed until the turn after it mega evolved. This mechanic is the reason why Mega Deancey runs Protect and why Mega Metacham and Lopunny run Fake Out. However, for a well-timed Garchomp, it could be beneficial, as for that one turn, it would have received the extra power of Mega Chomp while maintaining that incredible speed of Base Chomp. So Mega Garchomp was still incredibly disappointing relative to the potential it had. It's almost like Game Freak knew it would probably be too much if not slowed down, but at least it had this genuine OU usage. Electivire was one of the most exciting new additions from Generation 4, regularly spoken of with the same awe and hype used for other staples like Lucario, Infernape, and Garchomp. Previously, its pre-evolution Electabuzz had just been a tad too weak to make waves in OU, despite its incredible move pool positively overflowing with super effective coverage. At last, Electivire looked like it was going to fix that, maintaining that coverage while brandishing a monstrous base 123 attack. That wasn't all it had going for it either. It was actually slower than Electabuzz. Wouldn't that be a problem? You would think so, but Electivire was also gifted an amazing new ability, Motor Drive, which boosted its speed if hit by an Electro-type move. The combination of Gyarados and Electivire, or Gyrovire, seemed legendary from day one. Dragon Dance Gyarados was one of Diamond and Pearl's biggest threats, and it consistently demanded you strike it with a quad-affected Thunderbolt, which it took advantage of by switching to its teammate, Electivire, who would become speed boosted and thus perfectly equipped to smack what seemed like the entire metagame for super effective damage with its standard moveset of Thunder Punch, Ice Punch, Cross Chop, and Earthquake. That was an all it could wield either, as it could run Flamethrower to increase its super effective coverage against Pokemon like Bronzong or Hidden Power Grass to smack Swampert. Electivire seemed even more perfectly suited to this role of super effective Slasher with the new item Generation 4 had added, Extra Belt, which provided a hefty 20% boost to super effective hits. Its early hype was matched by enormous usage. Players were afraid to use Thunderbolt against Gyarados because they feared Electivire coming in. Even something like Blissey couldn't exactly toss around Thunder Waves freely. Soon, however, Electivire's flaws became apparent. It was let down by a number of factors. Most of the fact that, in practice, it wasn't exactly as strong as his base attack would suggest, because the base power of Thunder Punch and Ice Punch was just so ridiculously low. Thunder Punch was, pardon the pun, shockingly weak. It bounced off Pokemon and hurt super effectively like Suicune and Skarmory. If that was the case, even when boosted by Stab as well as Extra Belt, the Stabless Ice Punch was certainly not going to get past popular physical walls like Hippowder and Celebi. Electivire could run Life Orb, but not only did the recoil make it easier to pivot around, it still often wasn't even enough to get past such Pokemon. It was more reliable at scoring Okos with Cross Chop and Earthquake, whose much higher base power ensured that they would actually put away the target they were hitting super effectively. That was another problem, by the way. Electivire couldn't hit everything super effectively with only four moves, and it quite needed to because of its lack of bulk. Even if one considered Earthquake bad with Cross Chop, and one would be foolish to do so, since it would mean Electivire couldn't even Oko Infernape, let alone hit Metagross and Jirachi super effectively as if it really wanted to, they would still have to make the difficult choice between HP Grass and Flamethrower. Becoming a mixed attacker was problematic for Electivire too. Sometimes it ran Thunderbolt to actually knock out Skarmory, though it still come up short against Pokemon like Suicune. For some bizarre reason, it hadn't received a special attack boost upon evolving. However, even if it had, the inherent issue would remain, and that was that no matter how it divvied them up, it wouldn't be able to invest as many EVs into this many offenses as it needed. This problem on a Pokemon that struggled even with maxed out stats was beyond what it could handle. Some players attempted to get around the problem by going all physical and dropping Earthquake in favor of Meditate, so Electivire would gain a much needed boost to its attack as well as speed. However, even this was not enough, as Electivire was left helpless against the perpetually common Swampert, Bronzong, Jirachi, and Metagross, while still not being able to reliably break the likes of Hippowdon and Celebi thanks to its frailty and vulnerability to all forms of passive damage. If all that wasn't enough, even if Electivire faced a frail offensive team that lacked such walls and managed to get a motor drive boost, it was still outpaced by common fast Pokemon. Throughout most of Diamond and Pearl, it was Deoxys Speed and Scarf Garchomp. However, even after those were banned, Electivire wasn't getting past the incredibly popular Scarf Flygon. Offensive teams without Electivire beating Scarfers weren't exactly out of luck either, as Electivire's non-existent physical bulk meant that it was easily picked off after the slightest chip damage by common priority attacks like Lucario's Extreme Speed. All this was before the release of Pokemon Platinum, by the way, where Electivire was completely wiped off the map when that came out, because no matter what set it ran, it was completely, utterly, entirely, thoroughly dominated by the Rotom appliances. It shared the stain of the Rotoms with fellow Gen 4 Evolution Dusnor and and sadly, it also shared the same new player appeal that Dustnor had, where its innate qualities seemed too good to not try, therefore preventing its usage from dropping low enough for it to fall to Yu Yu, where it would have been excellent. Electivire is one of the most iconic poster Pokemon for disappointment. <laughs> 
Okay, so this one may seem weird, but hear us out. Just kidding. What a fake out, huh? Oh wait, you probably saw that coming because of the video's thumbnail. Just like how Zoroark's illusion ability almost never actually fooled anyone because of team preview. But the point remains, the hype around Zoroark was extraordinary, as was the subsequent disappointment when team preview was revealed. Team preview didn't exist before generation four and wasn't instantly announced as a feature of black and white. So the concept of a Pokemon that could pretend to be another one justifiably blew everyone's mind. This was going to change the entire game right there was no way it wasn't going to be banned maybe it would be too much even for ubers it was just so fundamentally ridiculous how could anyone possibly handle it was it just going to be a matter of using your own zoroark's illusion better there's no way that would be healthy it'd have to be banned there was no way it'd last long at all it'd be completely unbridled chaos how are you supposed to handle a pokemon when you don't even know if it's actually that pokemon oh i'm facing garchomp i better go to my garchomp counter oh wait that's actually a zoroark in disguise and I just lost my Garchomp counter. And so I'm probably going to lose the Garchomp later. How can I reasonably predict if the opposing Pokemon is actually Zoroark? Anything they send out for much of the game might be Zoroark. They might not even have one, but if they do, it could break the game. Yeah, should we even bother with this? This was an unreal, unwinnable guessing game. That was the type of talk flying around everywhere in early Generation 5. And then Team Preview was announced. And players went from demanding Zoroark's ban to laughing at how useless it now was. Zoroark itself wasn't a very impressive Pokemon by OU standards. In fact, it was quite meager. It had absolutely no defensive use and was incredibly limited as an offensive threat. Since you now knew that there was a Zoroark on the other team and you knew what else they had on their team, you were able to play around it much more easily, as opposed to the previous terror of the unknown that a team previewless Zoroark had inflicted before a single game of Gen 5 was played. Fortunately, Zoroark became quite a decent Pokemon in Yu Yu. It played well. It was an actual threat in and of itself in the tier and used illusion to bolster itself and its teammate further, as opposed to its entire viability revolving around the ability. Still, there's nothing more disappointing than going from breaker of the entire game of Pokemon to not even being used seriously in OU even for a little bit. So in conclusion, opinions on what make a disappointing Pokemon can vary. For example, some players became quite disappointed with Talonflame in Generation 6, which started as a top Pokemon but eventually lost uses once its flaws became more apparent. So we'd like to know which Pokemon throughout history have you been disappointed most by? Thank you, and we'll see you next time. So I just want to say thank you so much, False Fight, for having me on the channel. Guys, I hope you enjoy. I do actually do videos like these three to four times a month, and I have an Electivire video on my channel where False Swipe joined me, where we not only talk about why Electivire is a disappointment, but also ways that we can fix it competitively. So feel free to check that out. Leave a like on the video, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. And be sure to subscribe to False Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos. And thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all we got. See you next time, everyone.